Hi, everybody. Well, also a big thanks to Mr. Universala for inviting me here. Um, well, I will introduce myself shortly. I am uh, Nana Nuberg. I'm a historian. Uh, I graduated from the University of Amsterdam in 2014 with a master thesis on uh, violence um, and uh, Dutch military invasion of North Sumatra in the period 1945-1950. Uh, and since 2017, I write the blog Gewonen in this Meisje. Um, it is a blog where I am uh, writing about the influence of colonial history on, uh, on the Netherlands. I keep saying Holland, but then Marjolein will look at me angry and say, no, it's the Netherlands. Um, and especially on Indo-Dutch families in the Netherlands. And uh, last year I also researched during my travels to Indonesia uh, yeah, the legacy of colonialism uh, in Indonesia, but I'm not an expert on that, so I keep that to uh, someone else. As Marlene already uh, stated, I'm following the big research project that NIELT, NEMH, and KITV is um, doing right now closely. Um, for people that haven't heard of it yet, this is a research project that started in uh, 2016. And they are researching the violence of the Dutch military system in, an, uh, in Indonesia in the period between 1945 and 1950. And, well, I think people from Indonesia uh, that are here, they all know that in Indonesia this period is known as Agressi Militaire Blanda. But here in the Netherlands, we still don't really have a good word for that period. Uh, well, we used to call it police actions for a very long time. So, when I first heard of this new research project, uh, I was delighted and curious because I thought, yes, finally, it's time to uh, yeah, research cri in a critical way what the Netherlands have done in this period. Also, during my master thesis, it was already uh, really uh, totally clear to me that Holland, the Netherlands, um, fought a colonial battle uh, in which they um, framed Indonesian uh, freedom defenders as extremists and rebels. Um, and in my master thesis, I also showed how Dutch soldiers themselves started to lose faith uh, in the battle they were fighting. So some of them, after uh, a couple of years being in Indonesia, they started to questioning themselves if they were truly liberators, as the Dutch uh, had told them, or that they were actually, yeah, sort of Nazis, because they were occupying a country that wanted to be free. But other soldiers, and I think uh, this is the biggest group of soldiers, they remained convinced by the fact that Indonesia belonged to the Netherlands. So they felt betrayed uh, after uh, 1949, when the Dutch uh, signed the sovereignty um, transmission in uh, Amsterdam. So after these soldiers came home, um, they kept their experience silent and they didn't talk about it. Uh, and for a long time, no one heard of it. Well, I will give a short uh, summary of how it went from there because I'm not sure if everyone uh, knows this history. But it took almost 20 years before the first person opened up about what happened in Indonesia in this period, 1945, 1950. And this was Jo Putin. He was a veteran and in 1969, he opened up during a television program called After the News, After the News, Behind the News. Um, and there he explained the war crimes he committed and was uh, witnessed during his uh, military service in Indonesia. And he gave details in this uh, TV program about the killing of complete kampoons and their inhabitants committed without uh, any military necessity. And according to him, the things he witnessed and participated in were no exception, but daily business. This co confession of uh, Jo Hüting was the starting point of a discussion about Dutch violence in Indonesia in the period 1945-1950. And even now, 50 years after Hüting opened up, we are still not really sure how to place this past in the glorifying history of the Dutch nation. I mean, we are sea heroes, right? We came to explore, to trade, but definitely not to kill and oppress. To me, it's white innocence in its purest form. <coughs> so, 
what happened after uh, Jan Putting appeared on Dutch television? <coughs> well, politically, it led to the Excessa Nota. Only five months after uh, Hutting opened up. And this Excessa Nota can be translated as a list of excesses in which the Dutch government uh, researched the extreme violence that was committed or wasn't committed uh, in this period while Indonesia was fighting for to remain their freedom. And this list of excesses stated that there were no not so many war crimes committed in Indonesia and that there was much, not such a thing as extreme violence. So the public opinion uh, and the veterans, of course, could go back to a peaceful sleep in which it didn't have to give any recognition <coughs> or excuses towards the Republic of Indonesia. <coughs> and for many years, this remained the status quo, even though uh, rumors about Dutch war crimes never ended completely. This changed recently uh, after uh, Jeffy Pondag uh, founded the uh, organization Yaya San Kaukabe with the aim to increase knowledge about Dutch war crimes committed in Indonesia. And in 2008, he filed the first lawsuit against the Dutch state asking for recognition and financial reparations for the relatives of the men who got executed during the massacre of Rabakade on December 9, 1947. And in this uh, village on Eastern Jaffa, the Dutch brutally killed 400 people without any trial or military reason. None of the Dutch soldiers were, uh, who were part of this crime were ever prosecuted, <coughs> although uh, this crime was known by the VN. In uh, 2011, Jeffrey won his first case against the uh, Dutch states to get, uh, together with Lisbeth Segfeld. And after a long trial, uh, nine Indonesian relatives received 20,000 euro and official excuses uh, by the Dutch government. So after this acclaimed success, Bonda and Segfeld started a second trial, and this time collecting cases from the widows of South Sulawesi. And also uh, in this trial, uh, seven of these widows got compensations for the loss of her husbands, of their husbands. <coughs> during summary uh, execution, executions ordered by Dutch Captain Westerling. Um, well, these cases, they triggered uh, historians like Remy Limbach uh, and um, Gert Oost India, who uh, yeah, work for the uh, Dutch <coughs> military, NEMA, the National Institute for Dutch Military History, and um, Gert Oost India from KNTOV. Uh, and they asked in 2012, via an open letter in a newspaper, to, uh, to they asked the Dutch government to finance bigger and newer research to investigate this period uh, better. But this uh, open letter um, got declined and it didn't get any money, money to start a new big research project. But then they both uh, wrote books. Kurt Oost India wrote the book uh, Soldaten in Indonesia, Soldier in Indonesia. And uh, Remy Limbach wrote the book, The Burning Kampongs of General Spoor. And after uh, these books came out, um, suddenly the Dutch go government awoke, uh, woke up and they were like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe bigger research is more necessary because especially Remy Limbach, he stated that the Dutch use of violence uh, was not an exception, but um, yeah, was just common business and on, uh, happening on a large scale. So, in 2016, finally, a new research proposal uh, got approved, and the main uh, goal of this research propos proposal was to uh, find answers on these three questions. On what scale did violence took place? What kind of uh, violence took place? And why did violence took place? Well, and if you just read that proposal quickly, it might sound like the Dutch is really, are really trying to deal with their colonial past. So, as I told you when I first heard of it, I was quite enthusiastic. Unfortunately, this enthusiasm didn't last very long, because when you take a closer look at the research design, things become quite problematic. Well, I have a couple of more <coughs> minutes to show you why, and I will do that based on the open letter that Jeffrey Pondag um, wrote together with Indonesian intellectual Francesca Pantipelowi, and I do already uh, met her earlier today, and Historia Persana founder Marlene van Pache. 
And they published this letter a couple of weeks after the first public kickoff of the research project, yet it took uh, them one and a half years before they were invited um, at the research team to explain their objections. Oh, and by the way, 150 international researchers, journalists, and publicists signed the open letter. Well, since I have no time to examine the whole letter, I will just summarize um, some of their points and focus on these two questions, uh, namely, is this research inclusive? So what was the formation of the research design? Who were involved and who weren't? Uh, what is the nature of the cooperation with Indonesian universities and researchers? And yeah, what does working closely together mean? And the second question is, is this research decolonial? So uh, where is the focus on racism and the colonial apartheid system in this research? And how, is, uh, is, uh, how colonial is this research and how it reflects the myth mismatch between historical facts and Dutch juridical statements? Okay, well, I have a question for you. Um, imagine, uh, you get the assignment to investigate Dutch war crimes on a large scale. How would you set up your research? Who would you invite to draw the research outline together? Anyone? Jason? Anybody not linked to uh, Dutch defense, like uh, military organizations? Yeah. <laughs> uh, JC says anyone who's not linked to Dutch military organizations. OK. that's a Good answer. So who would you invite then? If you don't invite these people. Okay, well, I would say maybe Indonesian historians or Indonesian organizations, or at least a neutral research institute from another country, maybe. But this is not what the Dutch do. Because when the Dutch create the outline of a big research project focusing on war crimes they themselves committed, they invite as their sparing partners the Dutch Veteran Institute, the Dutch Memorial Committee, and several Dutch organizations that focus on the victimhood of Dutch people during the Japanese occupation and the Garcia. So let me be clear, clear about this. These organizations exist all with the aim to honor Dutch veterans and commemorate Dutch war victims. They have a tradition of framing the Japanese as the great oppressor in Southeast Asia, and uh, with framing Indonesians as ruthless extremists. I never caught any of these organizations on any critical note towards the Dutch rule as an extremely violent co colonizer. So, how could these organizations ever challenge the existing Dutch master narrative? How could, they involve, uh, how could their involvement possibly lead to critical research questions? Well, of course it didn't. And let's not forget that one of the three research institutes that uh, execute this whole project is the Dutch Institute for Military History. And this is the exact same organization that has to prove, commissioned by the Dutch state, the reliability of Indonesian witnesses and their stories in the lawsuits filed again, filed by Jeffrey Bundach and uh, Lisbeth Segveld. So, and since the, this institute only uses Dutch sources, like military reports, um, there are results often oppose stories as being told by Indonesian witnesses. <coughs> so according to this institute, it means that as long as a story is not written down in Dutch military reports, there is no proof for it. So this research uh, institute that has, that has to ex execute this critical research project has actually a direct conflict of interest in asking critical questions. So, okay, where is the Indonesian perspective here? Because when this research project was announced, it was framed as a critical project, unique in history and of history writing. Because for the first time ever, Dutch historians would work closely together with Indonesian historians. So maybe they invited Indonesian historians afterwards. Well, they invited one, namely uh, Professor Purvanto from the Gajamada University in Yogyakarta. And um, they came to him with a final research outline and uh, they asked his opinion. 
<coughs> well, and he was not very delighted. So in the end, he decided to start his own research project, separate from the one of the Dutch. So what does this working closely together then mean? So when I asked questions about it, the head of research, Fran van Frey, explained that within the budget of 4.1 million uh, euros, there was room for four Indonesian researchers based on local Indonesian salaries. And since this team of uh, Dr. Puwanto is now researching their own separate project, it means that there is no one who is actually critically following the Dutch partners in this. And uh, yeah, this, this um, Indonesian uh, project team also came up with another question uh, what the Dutch didn't uh, think of because uh, they are researching now the influence of the violence in 1945 and 1950 on social structures and trauma without the Indonesian, within the Indonesian population. So I think we can conclude that there is not such a thing as working closely together within this research. So that brings me to my second uh, question. Is this research colonial, uh, colonial or decolonial? Well, we will find um, the answers when we uh, look into the seven sub-studies in which none of uh, them is explici explicitly foc focusing on the question what is a colony exactly? What does a colony mean for people who, who never asked for it? And what are the structures within a colony that legitimize the use of violence against indigenous people? To me, these questions would be the most important questions to ask if you want to find an answer on the why. Why did the, U did the Dutch use violence on such a large scale? What was the influence of racism, for example, uh, or of the history of 350 years dehumanizing brown and black bodies? The period 1945-1950 is by no means a single isolated period in history. It is the outcome of 350 years of colonial violence and oppression. And let's not forget that historians like Remco Rabe and uh, Piet Hage estimate that colonial violence <coughs> cost one million people their lives during uh, th these 350 years of Dutch presence in Indonesia. Yet, this is nowhere to be found in the research project. This brings me to the last point that I want to highlight today. Um, this research is colonial in how it reflects in its very language the mismatch between historical facts and Dutch juridical statements. Because when you talk about the period 1945-1950, it brings up a lot more complications than you might think of in the first place and when you just take the colonial language we are taught in schools for granted. Because, did, uh, did you know that until today, the Netherlands do not recognize the 17th of August 1945 as Indonesia's uh, Independence Day? Instead of that, the Dutch uh, use uh, juridical the 27th of December 1949 as the, as the real day of Indonesian in independence, because on that day, the, the papers were signed for uh, power transmission. On the index square on Amsterdam. And actually, when you look at this frame, so you have on one hand the frame of the co ex colonizer, and on the other uh, hand the uh, yeah, 17 August 1945, which is recognized by the rest of the world, it brings in some difficulties while talking about historic uh, research towards this period. <coughs> because let's look at some facts. Um, because if you use the Dutch juridical statement, so you say Indonesia became independent on the 27th of uh, December 1949, you should, uh, this will be your research frame. So even though the uh, Japanese conquered the Dutch in 1942, the Indonesian archipelago still belongs to the Netherlands. Okay. After the proclamation of Sukarno and Hatta, the Dutch sent troops to fight against her own nationals because in the end, all people that were living in this part of the world belonged uh, to the Dutch flag. So all victims, even the people that fought for, the Indonesian, uh, for Indonesian freedom, they were inhabitants of the Dutch kingdom, living under the Dutch flag and rule. And it also means that the Dutch military killed her own inhabitants, 
that were defending an independent and free state. Or actually, when we take this, I, I, I made a mistake because if we take this frame, we, we are, they are not defending an independent state, but they are fighting for an independent and free state. Um, so what, what kind of frame do we get when we use the viewpoint that the whole, whole world is actually using? The 17th of August, 1945, is Indonesia's Independence Day. So that means that two days after the Japanese capitulation, Indonesia became a sovereign country. It means that the Dutch started a war against a sovereign state. It means that the Dutch tried to recolonize a sovereign state. It means that all acts of violence against Indonesian citizens are war crimes. It means that all acts of Indonesian violence against Dutch loyalists are acts of resistance. Conclusion, the Dutch behaved as Nazis. Let's take a second of silence for that. Um, so yeah, these two perspectives, they bring a completely different framework in how you research this history. And also they show us double standards of how the Dutch experienced their history. Just some questions that pop up. Pop up. Taking the Dutch juridical statement as a starting point, it leads to a couple of contradictions. For example, why does the Netherlands not commemorate the inhabitants of the Dutch kingdom that got killed by the Dutch military while fighting for their freedom? Why are Dutch historians talking about brutal Indonesians while in this period the Netherlands doesn't even recognize Indonesia as a sovereign country? So why do we use the word Indonesians then? And the same, um, yeah, the same happens for the word for the word Indonesian war, which I also saw <coughs> written down on the website of the research project. How can we use the word Indonesian war if we don't even recognize this country as existing in this period? So taking Indonesia's uh, independence on the 17th of August as a starting point, we should ask ourselves other questions. For example, why do we in the Netherlands talk about Japanese occupation, um, but never about Dutch occupation or Dutch recolonization? Why do Dutch publicists and historians keep calling Indonesian resistance fighters, republicans, extremists, rebels, or nationalists? And uh, why did the Netherlands never pay reparations to India, over to India, to Indonesia, uh, but made Indonesia pay to stay independent, as Michael stated earlier today? Because I think in all other cases, when a country starts an unfair war to another country, in the end, the person that loses pay the bill, right? But in this case, Indonesia had to pay Holland. Um, so yeah, even though and this is actually quite funny as well, because the researchers of Neil Kaiteo Fe and Enyem Ha, they say to acknowledge the historical fact that Indonesia became independent on the 17th of August, 1945. But they do not explain their own contradictions in thinking. And also, it's not visible in their research outline. None of this is visible in their research outline. So did they even ask themselves the questions I just mentioned while creating this proposal? I'm talking way too long, right? Sorry. Uh, the word resistance fighters is, for example, uh, never used in their research proposal. The word Dutch occupation is nowhere to be found. Uh, Dutch propaganda against people like Sukarno is not pointed out as a focus of uh, research. And the fact that Indonesia paid 4.5 billion guilders for their independence um, to be acknowledged by their former colonizer is also nowhere stated. And while neglecting all of those things, how will we ever be able to understand why we, the Netherlands as a country, fought such dirty war against the people of a country that won it? Or when we take 17 August 1945 as Indonesia's Independence Day, continue to be free? How will we ever be able to understand our role in uh, our our own role in world history. Well, I will conclude with some words to hopefully make you understand why I think it's important to investigate this history from a truly uh, critical, inclusive, and decolonial starting point. And I think um, my reason for that why it connects with uh, JC's story. Because to me, 
It's not only of great significance for a country to be able to look in a mirror, acknowledge your own mistakes, and see where your privilege comes from, but it's also important for a lot of people personally, uh, for example, for me. I also grew up in a, in a European family with grandparents that never understood why they had to leave the Dutch Indies and why Indonesian people suddenly turned their back against Dutch power. And my grandma, uh, she died in 2005 without ever seeing her country again. And she lost the ground on which she was born and grew up on. And she never wants to visit it again. She was never able to challenge her views on Indonesian independence, stuck within the Dutch colonial propaganda and Tempaduri stories as she was told as a kid. In the Netherlands, still, it's not general business to frame Sukarno as a freedom fighter. Until today, influenced by colonial propaganda that found its way into the history books, he is often framed as a radical nationalist in a negative way. The lack of understanding history through the perspective of the oppressed caused a lot of unnecessary hate and grief in my own family. But I don't want to look down on Indonesia like my grandma did, and I don't want to look down on the people whose blood is literally running through my veins. What I want is to understand history and to find peace with it. And that understanding I can only find if I know the, true, the truth and the true colors of colonialism. Because to me, immorality lies peace and not in reproducing colonial propaganda. Unfortunately, as I stated, I'm afraid that this new research project, in the way it is designed right now, will not bring the true and moral facts about our past. Thank you. Dramatic. Is this research inclusive? Is it no. <laughs>